Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Business Profit Acceleration Group Coaching. Our goal is unlimited profits and more free time to do what you love. Today, we're going to talk about one of the key things for leveraging our business. If, if we as individuals are our business, a sole proprietor, let's say we have a service business, you know, like what if I just did business coaching and it was me as the coach, then it would really be a job with maybe some tax benefits. But that's, that's not necessarily why we're here. There's nothing wrong with that. But our dream, in order to have unlimited profits, like exponential growth, unlimited profits, and more free time to do what we love to do, we need leverage. And two weeks ago, we talked about the 30-day test. So the 30-day test is, what if you left your business for 30 days? What would happen to business? What would happen to profitability? And I'll keep this short because I could, I could spend a long time on how to leverage your business. But the bottom line is products, information products or product sales is a great way to leverage a business. The other way to leverage a business is through team. And there's a couple of ways to do this. One is have team that actually provides the billable services or helps get the products out or take orders and that kind of thing. And the other is to free up our time for our passion, what we're really good at for business development, marketing and sales. We could even get help with marketing and sales. And the idea is that we hire people and we pay people and reward them at a fraction of, of what we bill out at. And that's, that's not to rip them off. It's, it's simply how businesses work, big businesses, small businesses, and just a quick rule of thumb. If, if you're paying someone 20 bucks an hour, you should start with billing them out at 60, 50, 60 bucks an hour, because you don't want to get below that 50% ratio. So that gives you some room to give them raises and retain them for, for quite some time. And I won't, I won't go into all those details, the, the challenge or the problem that people come to me really frequently with is how to find great people. I can't find great people. It's impossible to find great people. So here we go. How to attract great employees. Before we start with this, who sees either a current or future opportunity where you could get, it could be a bookkeeper, it could be a part-time assistant. It could be a marketing person, you know, who, and, and John, you're in a bank and I'm sure you're involved with hiring and firing. You're not necessarily yeah. an entrepreneur yet, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think this will be really relevant. Who has had an experience of, of hiring someone where it wasn't a really pleasant experience? Yeah, Chris, can you tell a little bit about that? Well, it's difficult to, to, to judge just from the interview process. A lot of people can get through the interview process and, and fool uh, the, the decision makers. That was back when I was still employed. So, uh, yes, that has happened to me. An employee seemed like a, a real uh, go-getter. But then it's difficult to judge when they'll go above and beyond the the, the requests. It's very easy for an employee to just meet the job description requirements. But if that's what... Uh, uh, the standard is set to, then uh, it leads to disappointment usually. Excellent. I think that's one of the key frustrations that people have. I call it kissing frogs. You know, in the interview, they're a prince. And then after six months, they're a frog. <laughs> so we're going to talk about how to deal with that. So what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what is, what's the challenge? What's the, what's the roadblocks? What, what do people experience commonly that we want to learn today how to do better? Not just do better, but do a great job at for long-term fantastic employees. And it starts with a positive mindset. And then what do we need to do to get started? What documents do we need? 
what do we, what do we need to do? And then the actual hiring process. <clears throat> so the keys to success in this process and what you're going to find is this process that I'm outlining today is going to work in many areas of your life and or business. So the first step is crystallize exactly what you want. When you're starting a business, you start with a mission and a vision. And when I coach people through creating their vision, I talk about using all five or six senses so that you can, you, you're living in it before it even happens. So what kind of person do you want? What kind of, I, I often say, and I'll probably say this again in this presentation, that you can't train attitude and aptitude. So aptitude is the ability to learn. Attitude is, is someone's, someone's just attitude, positive, negative. Are they self-motivated? I have not been able to make drastic changes, even though I've been coaching for a long time in those two areas. So that's important to, to crystallize up front. What kind of attitude do you want? What kind of aptitude do you want? And then, of course, there's the the skills, the abilities, the experience, the knowledge, et cetera. The second thing is you need to know it's possible. So if you've had ex bad experiences in the past or, you know, all the, all the entrepreneurs that you talk to say, oh, it's impossible to find great people. So just settle for what you can get, get a warm seat in there. The, the other thing is to play full out. And a lot of people say, oh, I'm too busy to do all the things that you're outlining, Jim. Well, I can tell you that the pain of repetitively hiring people and training people is much greater than playing full out in the initial process. So it's so worth it. And then the last piece is do not compromise. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to, I, I like the like dating analogy don't compromise. I've done that. There, there's red flags. And then I, you know, spend three years with somebody and the red flag turns out to be true. And it's like, ah, why did I do that? And it's the same thing with employees. So you can get exactly the person you want when you follow this process and you play full out. The challenge, and Chris, you outlined this earlier, is kissing frogs. You know, like getting people that slide through the cracks or ignoring red flags, um, finding good employees. We're talking about that. The other thing is, is retention. So how do you keep these people? And I'm probably going to cover that in, in another presentation. It depends on how the time goes, but that's equally key. And I would say that it's not always so much money as how you treat someone and how they feel and how, how their alignment with the job relates to their passion. So it's a lot of emotion. Um, of course, there's benefits and, and medical and pay and, and things like that. But the cost of turnover emotionally, physically, financially is, is super high. Has anybody experienced turnover and having to hire yeah, Stacy, I had a feeling that, that you've been through this experience. And uh, well, not only in my business, but also in my corporate life. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, gosh, there was this guy named Vince. That <laughs> was a early in management. He snowed me, man, hook, line, and sinker. And he turned out to be a, um, I don't know what the nice word is for that. Uh, not a good fit. in. <laughs> And then the economy, like right now, people say, well, back when the economy was, was, I've given this talk before, back when the economy was really hurt in 2008, 2009, um, pe people were getting laid off and fired and it actually made the pool of employees bigger. I think right now, people in the trades are having trouble because there's, there's just a lot of construction going on. And so the macro macro economy 
can make a difference in, in the size of the pool. But I just say it really doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter from the standpoint of just be committed to getting the person that you want, whether it's a part-time person, a full-time person, and committed to your high, high criteria, your standards, because these people are going to reflect your business, your mission, your vision, your purpose, your values. I won't spend a ton of the time on this, but again, I initiated this talk when I was up in Tahoe Truckee area and, and people would just always complain like it's, you can't find good people. They don't show up on, you, you don't, where do they go on a powder day? Um, and so that may happen here, but there are, there are a lot of people, there's a lot of choices. And if you believe, I know I'm harping on this, but just observe your own mind. And even if it's, subliminal or it's a quiet voice if you think it's impossible or it's going to be really hard then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy i love the examples of what the wright brothers did what nasa did you know human flight a human on the moon those are great examples of what's possible when you just believe it's possible and then set your mind to it i know I know NASA had a big budget, but still, that's just an incredible accomplishment. And then my own experience. I don't have a, a huge business, but I've, I've found people to help with my web and SEO and, and marketing for $20 an hour with master's degrees. They were super passionate. You know, so one person and they were part time. That sounds impossible. Like, how could you possibly find the person like that? But that's what I needed for my business at the time. And that's what I put out there. One woman was just brilliant. Two, two women were brilliant. And they were both in a financial position where their, their husband made more than enough money to pay all their bills, but they wanted to do something where they were meaningful and they used their education and something they were passionate about. So whatever you want is possible. So how do we get started? Again, crystallize exactly what you want. If you're looking for a part-time assistant, which I think would be the most relevant example for all of us, that's something, that's one of the biggest accelerators for entrepreneurs is not doing everything ourselves. And so my recommendation, you start with for two weeks, maybe three weeks, and even if you're super busy, just really commit to this. Journal your activities. What's a start time, end time, and what did you do? And just can be in a little notebook that you keep in your pocket, could be on your phone. There's apps for this, but journal your activities and then pull from that. What can you delegate right away? What can you train someone to delegate? What can you delegate in the future? Also, this is just a great activity for efficiency and really making sure that you're doing the right thing. Who knows what the number one weight loss tool is? Anybody? Tracking your food. Yeah, writing down everything you eat and drink. And it's the same thing with business. Um, you're, you're gonna not wanna write down that you ate two Snickers bars in the afternoon. <laughs> Same thing with your business. You're not going to want to write down that you spent 45 minutes on Facebook surfing. Um, so anyway, journal your activities. And then from those activities and from the things that you're not doing or not getting to create a job description. And that's experience, knowledge, tasks. And in the tasks, put what level you want. So there's job descriptions all over the internet. If you haven't done this before, you know, just find a few different examples or samples or templates online and it's not that hard to do. This is another example of, even if you've hired people and you've done a good job of hiring people, you want a job description. We add value to our business, the more documents and the more policies and procedures that we put in place because it allows you to leverage that. From the job description, you want to create an ad. And I, if 
even if you're not hiring somebody currently, please take notes on this because this ad model works incredibly and it's a little bit different than most ads. Most ads, just like most people doing their own website, they make the same mistake. So the first, the first thing in an ad, just like any, any uh, article or, or marketing is an attention grabbing headline, an attractive attention grabbing headline. So instead of executive assistant wanted, um, executive assistant position with, gro with growth opportunities and, and fun business needed or wanted. So a few adjectives can make a big difference in the title. The next short paragraph is just a normal, normal job description to let people know they're in the right place and what kind of position is this and what it's about. Then the next paragraph or, or set of bullet points would be what's in it for them. And this is flowers and unicorns and fairies. I mean, but real. <laughs> so flexible time, work from home, uh, super nice boss, uh, room for growth, education opportunities, whatever it is that you have to offer that would be enticing and attractive Put that in the ad next. And then, this is one of the keys. Then have a badass boss paragraph. For you, we're going to pick the best person to represent our amazing company, and we have high standards. You're going to need to dress professionally. You're going to need to be on time. You're going to need to be accountable, pay attention to detail, blah, blah, blah. So that's the brass tax paragraph. And what that does is it scares away mediocre people. It's really good. So make the job sound harder than it actually is and set your expectations high. And then the last section is just a clear call to action with a hurdle. So a clear call to action we're all familiar with. Send in, send in your resume and a cover letter explaining why you're the best person to represent our amazing company. And here's the hurdle. And in the body of your email, share your favorite hobby. So it's just a little thing, a little instruction that helps you select out. Like if you get, when you do this right, you should get 20, 30 applicants. And with the little hurdle like that, you can get rid of eight to 10 people right away. They're, they're, they're doing mass resumes, mass cover letters. They're not paying attention to detail. They're not someone you want in most cases. And then market like crazy. So wherever you can think of to market, whether it's Facebook, it would be just like marketing your business. So Indeed, Craigslist, and some people say, don't use Craigslist. You know, I've had bad results and scammers. You want to get as many options as possible. And, and two people I've hired have come from Craigslist and it's been great. If you don't want to, that's fine. I'm just saying, don't let that voice in your head or somebody else's experience stop you from really playing full out and getting the word out to as many people as possible. The more choices we have, the better a person we're going to get. All right. Any questions so far? All right. Is this valuable? Is it different? Okay, I'm seeing thumbs up, nodding heads. Awesome. So actually hiring, we talked about marketing and playing full out. <clears throat> Due diligence is key. And we're all busy. We all have a lot to do we don't want to interview every single person. That's crazy. So when I look at a cover letter and a resume, I can tell a lot and you can tell a lot. Did they, were they thoughtful? In their, in their cover letter, do they refer to your business? Did they, pull, did they go to your website and pull your mission and use some of that phraseology in their cover letter? If they did that, they're already in the top 10%. If it's a generic cover letter, 
there then remember attitude is something that we can't train how motivated are they how how much do they dig how much do they want it so and then if there's grammatical or spelling mistakes on their resume are you kidding me even if it's a plumber job i don't care you still want to have the professionalism to have somebody else you may not need to be good at grammar or spelling but you need to care about the details and so Right there, if I get 30 people, I can probably narrow down to 10 or 15 max that I, that I think are t- high maybes or high on the list of people I, I would wanna interview. And then I just do a quick 10, 15 minute phone screen with maybe the top five choices and see, see who to actually interview in person or on Zoom these days. So that's a very efficient way of going through a a pretty good number of of resumes. The other thing, you know, if if you're interested in HR laws, that's not my expertise. I'm going to bring in a guest speaker for HR um, some point in this year, because I think it'd be good for all of us. But if you want to, you can go to calchamber.com forward slash HR California. If you want to look at, you know, like, like, can you do a 1099? what's required for that, or it doesn't need to be a part-time employee on those, those kind of questions. And what are the laws regarding discrimination? That's really important as well. Now, interviews, write down the questions. Again, that's bringing value to your company. It's also bringing consistency to your interviewing process. And here's how to do it. You have, you had your job description, right? You have your ad. So figure out what are your musts? What are your top 10 musts or super high wants? And then write a question or maybe two max for each one of those. So if one of your musts is excellent customer service, then figure out what's an open-ended or what's a situational question regarding customer service. So (laughs) tell me about a time when a customer was irate and how did you handle it? And just do that for each one of your top five or 10 musts or high wants. And that's gonna make your interview much more powerful. And, you know, I I got quite good at interviewing in my corporate job But if I didn't have interview questions invariably written down that I followed, um, then I would end the interview, the person would go away and I'd be like, ah, I forgot to ask this. Has anybody had that experience? So anyway, I'd highly recommend writing them down. And again, you know, as you move up, as your business grows, you may not be interviewing. You might have a manager that's interviewing. So now those interview questions are written down, they're in in your business and they can be passed along. One of my favorite questions, you can have random questions to see how people think. So I was in chemical engineering at Genentech and one of my favorite questions is, why why are manhole covers round? And there's, there's about seven answers that make sense from an engineering standpoint. But most people don't think of that. And so it gets me a chance to see how they think on the spot. The second interview question that I loved, and I don't know where I got this, but was, you know, if you won the lottery, you had a million dollars, but you still had to work 40 hours a week, what would you do? So that's kind of an attitude and a passion question. And one woman was applying, she had a a master's degree in chemical engineering from MIT And she was applying for a process development chemical engineering job. And she said she would be a clown. And I thought that was awesome. You know, it didn't map to the job necessarily. But what I learned from that question was that she was honest with me. And that was great. So that was a that was a bonus. So you can have fun with your questions as well. It doesn't have to be all left brain analytical. And I mentioned this before, but really trust your gut. Red flags do come true. 
<laughs> if you think you can fix someone in a relationship or in a business, you're most likely going to be wrong. So, and then I've had some times where I, I can recall this one instance. And when you talk about trust your gut, right? Sometimes your gut could be telling you something completely different than, you know, any of the responses from the person where all of the answers may seem correct and everything that you're looking for. I had a situation, but I, I keep falling back to always trust your gut because I had a situation where I was ready to hire somebody because they checked all of the boxes, checked all of the boxes and um, seemed like everything was there. And there was this underlying feeling I couldn't quite place. And so I was going to extend an offer and I went to our HR department and then they said, can you, maybe we should do the background check first before we offer. So they already had some insight to something. Anyway, turned out that person had been let go for stealing from their former employer. That is, now, thank you for backing up that first yeah. bullet point. And mm -hmm. I just added your trust your gut <clears throat> to the slide as well. Gosh, it, it's just amazing. And where I think this pitfall would catch us is if we're super busy and our marketing is doing really well and we're growing like crazy and we need a person in as soon as possible, don't rush the process. Trust your gut. And then background checks are really important. As Stacy said, you can use talentwise.com. There's a number of different, different services you can use. And, and it's when you're down to three employees, it's worth it. You know, usually it's like 50 bucks to do a pretty thorough check on people. It is so worth it. You can also use hiring or temp agencies or a certified HR consultant. But most, most of us, if you follow this process, you're going to do quite well. I would add one more bullet point to that, Jim, and just okay. say, don't rush the process. Thank because you. when you're in those situations where you feel like you need somebody now, not later, you can choose the wrong person and then it ends up costing you more time in the long run anyway because it doesn't work out. Yeah. Thank you. So the next slide is about training. I have, I have just a, a few points on this. Training is so important. And if any of us thinks we're too busy to train someone, then there's a few things to think about. One, when they make mistakes, how much work will that create? Additional work and frustration. And then two, when you take the time to train somebody, you want to look, go look at your, your journal. You know, how often does this task get done? Maybe it gets done every day, twice a day. Maybe it gets done three times a week. And if you have an employee for a, a year minimum, how many hours would that save you? And oftentimes training will give you 20 fold, 10 fold, at least return on investment of your time. So even if you're super busy, you're feeling overwhelmed and stressed, you want to just breathe and, and really take the time, make sure that they understand that they're set up for success. The other thing is, I've been studying the best of the best businesses and what do they have in common? And the one thing that they have in common is all of the greatest businesses, could be even billion dollar businesses or the biggest growth businesses, the one thing they have in common is setting their employees up for success. So I, I don't, I don't, I think I stress that enough. <laughs> I, I, I really can't emphasize that. The other thing that, you know, if you're stressed out and busy, also, this is a tip that works. Have the employee create the training materials if you don't already have them. So have them take notes you explain the process, take notes. It could just start with simple bullet points, but have them create it, have them turn that into a Word document. And later on, it can be fleshed out into a full training standard operating procedure or whatever you need for your business. 
but it reinforces the learning and you're leveraging your employee even more. So your business will succeed, the employee will succeed, um, streamlining systems, they can help. The more you empower them and get a fresh perspective, the more you can streamline systems and, and get rid of bottlenecks. Checklists are really important, especially, especially when it's really easy to miss a detail or there's a lot of steps in a process. Anybody have any questions or comments on, on training? I guess the other thing I'll, I'll mention, I was a training manager for five years, is adult human beings have very short attention span. So we wanna break things down into chunks. So three to five points and then give, give them a break and let them, let them absorb it. The other thing is, you know, either have them create the training materials if they don't exist or build in some type of test or some, you know, whether it's a not, there's two types of training, knowledge and skills. So knowledge, you can just ask, ask questions and have them take a quiz that reinforces the knowledge and it lets you know that they really understand it. And then skills, you want to use the, the model of, you know, demonstrate it and then do it with them. And then they do it on your, their own with you watching and giving feedback. And then they should be able to go off on their own and give them permission to, to interrupt you, to ask questions and until they really get it right. And they're really, solid.